Hello, all. good morning, and um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where in the world you're watching us from. And welcome to the twenty, the first edition of um, uh, 2020, 2022, yes, Unplugged. Happy New Year to everyone that I haven't said Happy New Year to. And I think today is officially when I stop saying Happy New Year. It's the 13th, guys. The year is getting a bit old. But welcome to Unplugged. And I hope you're all well and you're ready to take on the challenges and enjoy the successes of a brand new year. I am, so I hope you are too. So over here at our end, we've kind of focused on giving you an even more finely curated experience this year and to start broadcasting on other platforms. We were going to try out Instagram today, but um, I think my liver failed me at the last minute, but we're going to do that next week and, and see how that, that comes. So you can access um, Unplugged on, in many more ways. Our theme as we warm up for business and for work this year and for life in general is open for business. That's our theme for January. That's what we're going to be focusing on. And our guest today is somebody who is extremely special to me. And I suspect that for many of you who are going to be on this show today, she's very special to you as well. Well, I don't get to have this kind of public conversations too many times with somebody I call my coach. I don't get to call many people my coach, but she is somebody who is extremely special. And I believe that God brought us together in a very unique way. That will be a story for another day. So I'm going to save all this experience and permits me to preen a little bit as I introduce Pastor Bidemi McMordy, or as I call her, Sister B. I will read out her, her profile, which really does no justice to her. Pastor Bidemi McMordy is the CEO of Verbatim Communications Limited. She's a multi-talented life coach trainer, a public speaker, an author, and a publisher with over two decades of experience in leadership, values-based human capital development. She's an alumni of the Hegai Leadership Institute, a member of the John C. Maxwell Founders Circle Coaching, and a, the pastor of the Well Oasis International. Sister B's versatility, her capacity for faith-based deep thinking and strong ability to, to think on her feet, find expression in the compelling nature of her ideas and presentations. Her goal is to reveal God's glory in all she does and to help transform people to do the same. Pastor Bidemi McMordy believes that the human spirit is like an elastic band. The greater the stretch, the greater your capacity. Over the years, Sister B has consistently shown up to an engaged global online community of thousands of active followers, where she offers life success training daily and in also specialized modules. She's an avid reader. She's a prolific writer. She has authored more than 18 books. She's only published 18, but she's authored more. She has many more books inside her. And then she is my coach. And today I present to you, Pastor Bidemi McMordy, Sister B. Welcome, Sister B. Welcome, sis. Hey, hey, sis. Good morning, everyone. Hello, Julia. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Hey, Unplugged Family, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, great work you are doing. I especially like the Very Well Made in Nigeria series, and I hope that series is returning this year as well. Well, since it's, it's becoming a movement, thank you. It's it's becoming a that's yes, that's yes. Thank you for yes. having me. Anyhow, and happy new year. Happy new year to you, sis. Happy new year. So let's start off by definitions. I mean, you taught me well, so you like definitions. So I like definitions now. We look at work and we look at business. Mm. Are these the same or how does one flow into the other? Work and business. Yes. Um, 
work is, um, if I had to define it as loosely as is possible, um, and it's actually my preferred uh, definition, work is the channel through which God commits wealth to his children. Part number one of that definition. Part number two is that work is also the channel by which God brings order to the world and establishes his mark on the world. So if you ask me work and business, is there a difference or are they the same? Business is an expression of work. Business okay. is an expression of work. Because when you, when you are a business person or an entrepreneur, what you're doing is you're taking whatever ideas or skills or an empowerment that God has given you and you've uh, distilled it into something, a solution that people pay for. All of work is about solution. So work is not, um, is not work if it does not provide a solution. I believe that business is not business as well, because the, if the only reason why business is set up is for profit, then someone has made a mistake. So business is not for the sake of business. Business is about solutions as well. To that extent, you can say business is an offshoot of work. Is one expression of work. You, not all of us are entrepreneurs, but those of us who are, when we set up our businesses and we begin to run with them, then um, work. A business is an expression of work. I, I think that's really um, interesting. I never looked at it that way, even though I have read your um, your book, Theology of Work. Guys, you know, I'm I'm very shameless in uh, advertising. My my coach doesn't advertise. Guys, if you don't have this book, look at it well, eh? Theology of Work. Please go buy it. Eh? Go buy it. It's it it will change your mind about how how you look at work. And um, work is um, a channel through which God commits wealth and also how he creates order on the world. So for those who call work hustle and those who call work, um, how do I call it, just somewhere to go to, what would you say to them? Um, it was the, um, the um, Dr. Miles Monroe of uh, Blessed Memory who said that when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. Ah. So when you see work as a hustle, or work is some, somewhere you go to mark time so that you can earn some money at the end of the day, you have it upside down. Really, that's what it is. Because unless you know why you go to work, then you don't get to make the valid contributions that I know you can make. And unless you make the valid contributions that I know you can make, you cannot exactly tend to wealth because everything about work is configured to birth the mind of God, make God's people wealthy, and then take care of the, 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 the earth, which is bringing the kingdom of God to bear upon the earth. So to wake up and actually go somewhere and spend, say from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and you think that um, you were just marking time so that you can get a salary, is one of the saddest things that can happen to people. So like you said, definitions are important, just as well as, as much as knowing the why of a thing is important. If you know why you go to work, the odds are you'll be happier. The odds are, the chances are higher that you will be, you will be a more valuable contributor and the, um, the chances are higher that you'll be promoted and you'll be paid more and you'll be treated well. But unless you understand that, I don't go to work because I'm an adult and I have to go to work. Work is not something adults do. So it's not, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a consequence of adulting. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what work is. I was going to say that adulting. <laughs> yes, work is not a consequence of adulting. You work because God has put something on you to contribute, something valuable inside of you to contribute to the world. And if you take it like that, you would, you, you would see that your path gets brighter and brighter 
because no matter where you go, you are able to contribute value. In the time, we, we work with a lot of growing businesses, actually mainly with growing businesses. And um, we follow them also very closely on their socials and any other way they, they choose to advertise themselves and, mm. and promote themselves. And we find out that that word hustle becomes, um, it, it, it's like the in thing, the buzzword. And um, I, I, I don't call my work hustle. I don't care how small or big it is. It's not a hustle. I'm not doing it as a side thing. That's that's my main thing. But I had actually made the comment you made about something that you do when you're, you're old. I mean, it's not something you do in your adult years to get money and live according to a desired lifestyle. But that's, that has become a kind of mindset. And I don't want to call it a generational mindset because it's um, something that does span different generations. But how do we shift mindsets from work and business as a means of earning some coins or may maybe many coins to a means of restoring order and creating wealth, abundance? So um, let's just stick with the definition of the word hustle. So as you were speaking, I quickly um, went to Google to say, what's even the definition? What's the biblical definition of the word hustle? I'm looking at my dictionary and it says that hustle is to push roughly, to oh. jostle. <laughs> hustle, um, hustle is to obtain illicitly oh. or by forceful action. Okay. So <laughs> how do you okay. take your work and call it a hustle? You know, slangs are very popular. Slangs become really popular and they gain ground. But when you identify or you define what you're doing properly, then the, the I do not want to wax really Christianity here this morning. But I want us to know that the work you do is value. And when you call it hustle, and if I go by these definitions that I have seen, then ultimately, I don't think after, when you meet the challenges that are bound to come when you're running this business, that you would continue to push through because it, you would always have the mind that your mindset would always be is something that I'm just doing. Um, now, I know that people tend to um, chance upon a business, not because it was what they planned, but it was something, maybe life happened, they lost a job or something, something, something. And because of that, they set up a business. But once your business is able to, create a value that makes me want to give you my money, your eyes ought to be open that it is not an accident. What brought it to, to, to fruition or to manifestation may be an accident, but the act in itself, the business in itself is not an accident. So your question was how that is just something I'm doing or is a side the only way to shift it is to go to what I call original intent. How did God um, institute work? Why did God institute work? Exactly why did God bring work to pass? If you read the account of the book of Genesis, let me put on the pastor act for a hat for a minute. <laughs> what you will find is that work is how God... Um, um, is how God empowered Adam so that he could take charge of the earth. So that he could take charge of the earth. Now, if that is the case, then when you come, whether you sell tomatoes or you do pastries or you sell fresh juices, whatever your business is, you are taking charge of a piece of the earth. You work, let me say it this way. I think this is the most um, intelligent way to say it. Work is your tool of dominion. 
a tool of dominion. Now, if you know that work is a tool of dominion, do you honestly want to call it any other thing or do you want to treat it as something that could be here this moment and not here the next moment? What is dominion? Dominion is how you establish and put yourself in charge and control. And God created us and put us on earth and says you can put yourself in charge and control. I give you the capacity. Now, in what is the capacity that is giving you? The, whether it's whatever your business ends up being or whatever your work ends up being, it's what I call <clears throat> your first dominion. Your gifts, your talents, your giftings, your talents that you develop into skills you develop into products you develop into services god gave those things to you so that you can dominate now this is not <coughs> oppression dominate this is um this is not oppression dominate this is dominion that means that you are able to <coughs> Stand in the place of God as an ambassador of heaven and bring order in the place where you've been called to bring order. So to shift the mindset, that's the question I'm answering. Yes. You need to go back and recognize that your work is your tool for dominion. The Dangotes, the Rockefellers, the Bill Gates of this world, <clears throat> We defer to them in many things because they have exercised their dominion in their sphere of influence. None of them started big. Everybody started small. But see where they are now. If they treated it as a side, a side hustle, that's the expression we use, or something I come to when I don't have something else to do. How would that have been the case by now? It's a totally different case. <coughs> Sorry, sis. So, essentially, work is your opportunity to be like God and to be God in a piece of the earth. Treat it with respect. Treat it with all the seriousness that it deserves. Put in the work and you are bound to get the harvest. Did I answer your question? Very well. I'm just thinking that I'm not. I'm not sure that um, one hour is is enough. For me. It, it will just have to do. So, Feikemi, thank you very much. Your, your comment is um, exercise your dominion in your sphere of influence. Yes, that's yes. a bam, that's a bam absolutely comment. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And I, I would suggest to you all, please, my brothers and sisters sitting here, please take your you, take. Hold the pen and the paper close by because I'm not sure we are going to be able to capture everything that Sister B is going to um, to share with us today. You know, I'm not sure she's going to, we are going to capture it all. But you can come back and watch the replay on uh, YouTube. And um, while we are at it, we are going. We're giving away. This is our own way. We, we are a knowledge-based um, organization at Jilla Jacks Consulting, and this is how we do our giveaways. We give away knowledge, we share knowledge. And this is the latest book by Sister B. Now, you've all come in and we appreciate you coming in. So please just write any number, pick any number from one, between one and 30. And we're going to do um, a raffle draw. I do, well, let's call it the draw. We're gonna do a virtual draw, you know, just before we close this um, broadcast today. So if you're interested in getting a copy of the book, it's for two people. We have two books to give. So if you're interested in giving a copy, please. Okay, somebody has taken, okay, 20 is UD. Okay. Okay, somebody will be noting your, your, your numbers as well. Yeah, Faye Kemi, thank you that you're 17. Oh, yeah. 
Are you taking down the numbers? Okay. Now well, we go on. So the the topic, this a bit, the topic really is what do you see? Mm. And we're looking at to start with vision. What do you see? When you look at um, and this is talking to us, when you look at your life, you look at your family, you look at the work you're engaged in. Why is vision important? Why is vision important? Yes. Is that my question all day? Yes. <laughs> yes. Because you were talking to them at a point. Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry, sis. That, that's your question. Why is okay, vision, so vision important? Why is vision important? Yes. Why are eyes important? So we can see. Vision are the eyes of your future. Vision are the eyes of your future. What you can see based on what God has put on the inside of you. What you articulate that we call a vision statement is the eye of your future. So if your physical eyes is so you can see and move from one place to the other, vision is how you know where to go, how to go, what to pursue, what to give yourself to, what not to give yourself to, and all of that. So vision is the eye of your future. I, I, there's no other way that I want to say it. It's the eye of your future. By vision, a man who has vision can travel to many clients. He could do many things. So vision is important. Everyone needs to be able to have vision or everybody needs to have vision. To articulate vision, really, is the, is the expression I prefer to use. So that their future is secure. They have a roadmap for their future. Okay. So you need to articulate your vision, which is really not just to think about it, but to write it down. Yes, yes. And it keep refining an it. Yes. yes, there are many things that converge to become your, 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 the articulation of your vision, but... Yes, an articulation is required. So, sis, um, when we think generally about vision, I'm asking not just for myself, for everybody here, because many of us are growing businesses. And mm -hmm. we think um, what we should do is to write something that somebody else has written and put on a wall, and put it on a wall without... How do we get around doing actually having a vision, you know, and um, having a vision not just for the work, but also for your family, for parenting, for being a wife. I mean, you taught me that, that every, every marriage must have a purpose and a vision, you know. You have to have a purpose, I think you said, yes. There has to be a purpose for your marriage, you know. So there has to be a purpose in, in that wise for, I think, practically everything. So how do we do it? How do we sit down? and do it okay so there are three things that i i i um, um i i pull together to bring um what us to a nexus of what any vision for anything will be so let's say vision for your life the first thing you want to look at is what i call your first dominion your giftings and your talents what do you know how to do what comes easy for you? All of these things inform the direction you should be headed and the things you should be invested in. The second thing is your experiences. And when I talk about experiences, I'm talking about your good, your, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everything again culminates in the place where they help you formulate what we call on Instagram a POV, a point of view. So your first dominion, your gifts and the talents, they equip you for passion. I'm taking notes myself. They equip <laughs> you for passion. Then your This if you're writing a book, I'm co-writing this one. No? <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 um, they equip you for passion. Your, your, your gifts equip, equip you for passion. 
they activate passion in you. So the things that you are good at, the things that come easy to you, usually formulate what you tilt to for your passion, for the things you're passionate about. Your experiences are filters. They are filters that help you formulate your, what I call your life sentence. They formulate this sentence in your life that is really, if use Instagram words, is a point of view about life. Then the third thing are your, is your environment. Your environment, whether for the good or for the bad, also has a way of distilling in you either a strength or a weakness, an affinity or a repulsiveness to a certain kind of thing, kind of person, kind of place, or whatever. Now, when you take these three things, your gifts or your first dominions, dominion, you take your experiences and you take your environment, that place where they intersect, the intersection is where you find the articulation of your vision. Okay. okay, so maybe if I gave an example, my first dominion is the capacity to use words. I am blessed to be able to use words. I write them for books, I teach them. I am just blessed to be able to use words. I can write long words, I can do short words, I can do one word that makes a, it makes a, a meaning and makes a difference. I am blessed to be able to use words. Now, because I'm blessed to be able to use words, it made me passionate about books. So from a really young age, I read the dictionary. I read a lot of books. A book was the best gift you could give to me. And that meant I read any and everything that had words in them. Then my experiences. I've had some really great experiences in my lifetime. I've had some really bitter experiences. And I've had some in-between experiences. All of those experiences made me decide, for instance, that I will be that person who would live my life authentically. I will be that person who would not toy with people. I will be that person who would live my life above and beyond reproach. Even be before I became a Christian, I believed seriously in saying what I mean and meaning what I say. It didn't matter what it sounded like. I, if I say it to you, I meant it. And I was going to be able to stand by what I said for a long time. So my point of view really is just to be like this, open. If you see me, what you see is what you get. Then my environment. I've gone through many environments as I have grown. But the most basic of my environment, the one that shaped me, was in my parents' home. I grew up in a polygamous home, which meant that my father had more than one wife, and which meant that our house was a mini huge house of commotion. There was drama. It was fun sometimes, but most of the time it wasn't fun. All of these things, three things made me, I think when I was leaving home, the first time I was leaving home, leaving home, I was leaving for my youth service. And I made myself a promise. And my promise was, I cannot come back to this house unless I have made something of myself. So nobody compelled me to make that decision. I made that decision and I stepped out. In stepping out, I had to take some few more knocks. But because I was determined that I would not go back to my village. Some of you know the name of my village. I was not going to go back to Lampese, the <laughs> same way I left it. I gritted my teeth and I bought many things. Because I wanted to be able to say, I made something of my life. Now, by the time I became a believer and I began to read again and I began to grow, I realized that I wasn't a statistic. I grew, I was put on earth by God and he actually does trust me to do something with the life he's given me. 
by the time I take all of these and I plugged into that particular understanding, I knew I had to live my life to be, to be a solutionist. I knew I had to live my life to give to people and to make a difference. And even when I didn't know what it was, I kept trying different things until I arrived at a place where I realized that this was what fits, for, fits me. And I'm doing this now. And I'm not even um, confident that it will not change or evolve after some time. But whether I am a husband to my wife, to my husband, I beg your pardon, whether I'm a, a wife to my husband, or I'm a mother to my children, or I'm a pastor to the congregation, or I'm a friend or a sister or a daughter, everyone I meet, the vision for my life is to help them become. So if you ask me, why are you alive? I'm alive to help people become. Now people become many things under my tutelage. But these three, these three things, plus my understanding that God put me here for a reason, is the reason why if you sit in front of me and if you're paying attention, you are bound to become who God has called you to be. I don't know if that explanation or a delve into my life um, sheds a bit of light in answering the question a bit more. It, it, it has. It has. I would say when... when we first met and um, I started sitting under your coaching and your tutelage mm -hmm. and your pastoring. Um, there are things that you told me from the beginning that I, I, I rebelled against. I knew I was rebelling against it, but you just ignored me, you know? And there were things concerning the environment I was in that I, was, I told you I, I needed to leave. I needed to, and you just looked at me and you smiled and uh, you didn't pay me any attention until I think it took me like four years. I, I, I could be stopped on that way. Until I now said, okay. And truly, it was, interestingly, the shutting down of the world and the, of the physical world and the opening up of the virtual world that made me say, hey, I can really be. And I came back to tell you, Sister B, you were right. You were right from the beginning. And then, thank you for not saying I told you so. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Um, the reason why I told you so is not the best response to such situations is because every one of us is constantly becoming. Every one of us is constantly evolving and becoming. And why some of us embrace the things that make us uncomfortable a lot more readily, most of us do not. What I usually would say to people is do your best not to shut the door. Keep the door open. And once in a while, come back and um, investigate what it is that you've been told. And hopefully, ultimately, a day comes when it comes together and you find that, oh, this is what it is. So really, that's why to say I told you so would be counterproductive because people are different and our journeys tend to be different. Thank you, Sister B. We are, we are just about halfway through and... Um... I'd like to open it up if there are any questions that people have specifically to ask Sister B. Um, because if you don't, I, you see, these are my own questions. I have plenty. But this is for you and for me and also for your, for your businesses. Remember that the, the theme for January is open for business. And the best mm -hmm. way to open for business, in my opinion, is to sit down, not just jump into things. If you didn't have time to do it in December, spend your January, spend part of February. Consider why you're doing what you want to do. Think about it carefully and then work on these things like having a vision for your business. I know that if, if you ever call your business a hustle, what you're doing is that you're pushing roughly and you're obtaining things illicitly. That one got me, you know, that's what you're doing, you know. Okay, I'll take questions when they come, but let me also remind you, please, to um, follow us at Julia Jacks Consulting on um, Facebook, on Instagram, and on YouTube. There are lots of resources, and um, I believe from next week we will be, um, or maybe, anyway, before the end of January, we will be streaming on um, more than one platform to make it convenient for, for everybody. 
And Feikemi, thank you so much for capturing it so, um, what Sister B has said so eloquently. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's a great sound bite right there. So guys, remember, we still have, we have um, two copies of Building Blocks by Sister B. And um, we're going to give, we're going to give those out um, at um, almost the top of the hour. So if you have put your name, sorry, your number, we have noticed, noted your number. If you have put in your number, any number between one and 30, because I can see we're like 13 people online right now, we may be more, but we're about 13 people online. But um, yeah, put in the number and then, um, and let's see how it goes. Now, sis, there is something I want to um, to really dig into. You mentioned passion. Mm -hmm. I think passion is one of those words like purpose that we bandy around. I have a passion for this, and it's it's in two ways. I want to I want to I was I was talking to someone not too long ago, late late in December, and. Um, I asked her, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to, I want to live up my purpose in life. And I said, what is your purpose? What do you think is your purpose? And she said, well, she thinks that since I'm a coach, I'm the one that will bring it out of her. I said, no, I won't, I won't bring out your purpose because my purpose is a different purpose and it's, I'm still discovering it. So what do you think is purpose? And it turned out in the end that what she wanted was couch. What she wanted was really to be, um, she wanted to express her ambition, you know, a big thing. But she felt she had to couch it in a small, nice, delicate, female friendly, society friendly, church friendly language to say, oh, my purpose is, is to serve God with all I want. And then people also say, my passion, my passion is for, for widows because I'm a widow. Okay, I'm not a widow, but or my passion is to um, take care of children because um, I've all, my mother used to take care of children or I, I was that child that was not taken care of. But they really do not have the structures or know how to put it together. It's a, quite a long-winded um, question, you know. But most every must everyone have a purpose? Must purpose be big? Must it be small? Does passion necessarily translate into purpose? Those are my Okay, questions. so um, I think that first nomenclature is wrong. The word purpose, um, purpose, all of us have the same purpose. Every man has the same purpose with every woman. Our purpose is to bring glory to God. That's the reason God put us in the earth. If you look at Revelations chapter 4, verse number 12, we're all put here so that we can bring glory to God. That is purpose. Now, within purpose are different assignments. Assignments that we can, if we wanted to look at it from the point of view of theology of work, that we can actually call work or business. But they're really, whether it's a business, whether it's a job, it's an assignment. Now, assignments differ, and assignments are the things that bring, uh, is, is the nexus you arrive at where you, you craft your vision properly. Your vision would point you to what your assignment should be, but the purpose is the same. Every single person, whatever you do that glorifies God is purposeful. Now, you could be passionate about something and not, and it is not your assignment. You know, when you said, you used the expression of, oh, people who want to now take care of widows because they have been widowed, or someone who is now in some kind of advocacy because of something that happened to them. I realized that just because something happens to you does not mean that God is assigned that thing to you. So just because you are raped, you were raped, does not mean that you have to go into advocacy against rape. Assignments are assigned by who you are. That is what God has gifted you with. 
by your experiences yes i said the good the bad and the ugly and the point of view that you've been able to distill from those experiences and by your environment but your assignment is not your purpose if you do your assignment well then your life is purposeful because you will glorify god in the process that's why also we can't begin to say oh purpose is um um, we can't begin to say, oh, my purpose is to, we cannot always classify purposeful living with being, with holding a microphone or being in church or being in the choir. You can actually be what we call a secular artist and yet be living, walking in your purpose. I grew up on the Don Williams and the Jim Reeves of this world. Their music was clean. Their music always had a message. Their, one of my favorites is the one I can't, uh, I can't remember the title, but somewhere part of the lyrics says, you, you don't count your money when you're seated at the table. The, table. the gambler. When the time enough to count yes. is when the deal is gone. Yes. It, it, it became a let me not say philosophy, but it became, it became a, a pillar for how I do life. And up to tomorrow, when I come to you, say for instance, and you hand me money, and you're not sending me on an errand with money, I never count money in front of the one who gives me money. I just think that it's a bit of a disrespect for someone to be gifting me money. And I begin to count to ascertain how much he gave, he's given me. But that came from a song my father played over and over and over as I grew up. So it doesn't have to have the word Jesus is great to be purposeful. It doesn't have to have biblical verses in it to be purposeful. It just needs to flow from what God is put on the inside of you and distilled out of what life is taking you through to the extent that it gives God glory. Do, do you understand that? I get so that. So once you see that. it from that angle, you will recognize that purpose is not born again. OK. Um, since I'm just waiting, because uh, I think I'm getting the arrows from here. <laughs> OK. Yes. I think you just set a lot of people free just now. Purpose doesn't necessarily have to be Christian. Purpose is not, I think it was last week I posted and I said that shock, the shocker is purposeful living is not the exclusive re reserve of believers. It is not. Because there are believers who, because of their work, people are alive today. They discovered cure for what used to be fatal diseases yes and they did not know god but god had put it on the inside of them and they ought to if they had connected with god they will have a better lease of life and they will probably be a, probably have lived longer and they'll probably have been able to impact people beyond that um that patent that they have but that they rebuffed god did not mean that they could don't live their life to manifest on the earth what God called them to. So purpose is not born again. And if we don't recognize that well, but as believers, when you do it, God is glorified. What that also immediately means is that just because you're living a purposeful life is not the same translation as it will go to heaven. There okay. are a lot of people living lives of purpose that are going to be gate men in hell. Because what makes bring someone to heaven is that they give their life to Jesus. <laughs> and we need to just separate these things and be fine. You know, as a pastor, I, everybody would want me to say, ah, purpose is Bob biblical. You know, you have to. But no. No. If you do a Google or search your Bible, you'll find out that the word purpose sparingly appears in the Bible. So purpose is not Christian. Purposeful living is to be able to glorify God. And because of that, whatever I do to glorify God, 
is purposeful living. The thing is, it is sweeter when I'm in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you can still do stuff that would, many generations later, people will be talking after you, talking about you, or talking about someone, and the person will be rotting in hell. So just because people have say they are living a life of purpose is not the same as they have they have a one way ticket to heaven. You still have to work out your salvation. One of you still have to be saved and then work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I hope that just sets people free so that we'll just be fine. I I, I believe so. I I believe so. But the other part of it is like, must purpose be a big thing? No, 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 no. You see, um, if God called you to raise two children and you raise them well, what will happen is that your children can go on and be MDs of something, even if they don't end up being MDs of something. As long as you raise two good human beings by, by the length, the parameters of what God has called you to do, you have lived a life of purpose. Purpose need not be grand. I think that the pressure that we face is that we think that purpose mood puts us in the neon lights. There are some people who have lived the most purposeful lives, but they lived in the back streets. If, more, if we did not take our cameras and clear lights to Mother, Mother Teresa, she would have done yeah. an excellent job and no one would have known her because she never hugged the limelight. So purpose doesn't need to be grand. Purpose doesn't need to be educated for it to be purpose. What is purpose? It's living what you are created for. That's just the simple understanding of purpose. So if I'm created to just raise two children and raise them well, who does say to me that I didn't, work, I didn't do my work of purpose well? The Wesley brothers, their mother was a washerwoman. But she raised these men, these young men, and she raised them well. They all went to be the ones that were known all over the place. The only reason we know about Susan Wesley is because we knew, know about John Wesley, not because she did anything beyond raising her children. So purpose doesn't need to um, wear an Armani suit. Mm. Purpose doesn't need to work in a uh, big white collar. Purpose just needs to deliver on what God put on the inside of us. See, the mother is required. The cleaner is required. That's how life goes around. If you're called to clean and you clean well, you can, your job, your primary assignment from God is to make environments clean. You, if, you, if you look beyond I'm sweeping and I'm mopping, you will see that when environments are clean, disease is less. You are keeping people safe. And when you understand that with my cleaning business, for instance, I am keeping people safe. You ought to go to bed at night, at night when you finish cleaning a house that you got there and it was really dirty. You ought to go back home, uh, go to bed at night and feel like I did what God put me on earth to do today. And when you do it well and you consistently do it well, it will tend to work. But not every time you are stupendously rich. But there is no way you live a life of purpose that you do, your needs are not met. So there are many misconceptions of purpose. And um, um, if you want to know more, maybe you need to ask Julia how to be part of what we do to distill purposeful living a bit more. Yes, guys, please ask me. Still ask me, but um, I can tell you also for free that please Google um, Pastor B, Sister B, I call her sis, but well, for the purpose of this, I call her sister bitch, you know. And um, she runs something, um, a program called, actually, I believe it's going to, okay, let me not speak uh, ahead of myself, but Purpose University is a whole learning that will turn your mind inside out. And I believe, I, I think I was one of the first, I think I did it twice. I mean, I mean, I have to yes, go. Yes, you did it in 2016, and you did it in 2020. I mean, I may have to go in again because purpose, like she says, keeps you keep tweaking and you keep refining, and um, you keep discovering different parts of yourself. I mean, she mentioned um, for some of you who weren't here at the beginning, 
um, she did mention that she liked what we did with Very Well Made in Nigeria. And I tell you the truth, I did not, when we started that pro program, it was to celebrate Nigeria because I was just sick and tired of people having a down on Nigeria. We are still here. So why are you going to curse somewhere that is still sustaining you? And the very first guest we had, Mr. Uche Oti, said to me that he had been thinking about it and that this thing is not just a conversation, this is a movement. And when he said it, you know, I just wrote it down and I sat with it and he kept saying it. He said, Julia, this is a movement. This is not just something that you should do and run away and leave it. And um, it has stayed with me and it has now become a thing that is, I'm sure very soon we are, we are going to tell you about it, but it has become a thing. I didn't think that I had that level of advocacy in my in my in my life but um i am so passionate about it because i've always been the patriots god god puts me here for a purpose if not uh, he would have put me in canada or somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> here we are and you would not have been able to stand the cold if i know you no no says i i can't i don't have any hair on my head that's god did not make mistakes. so where you are is where you want to be yes 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 Okay, yes, we have um, some okay. Okay says your needs must be met. Yes, when you're in purpose, you must not be stupendously rich. You may not be stupendously rich. Yes, you may not be, but um, definitely. I mean, we've seen that song, All I Have Needed, I Had Has Provided. And I think we don't need Bone Street. Bone Street is nice, I mean, for those who can get it. You know, Lexus is nice for those who can get it, but I think if you want and to, and I think cool. that I actually think that if you do purpose well, you can even afford both streets. It's too, it's too yes. it's not that expensive actually. Yes, <laughs> you can have it. I mean, if you need it, I mean, yeah, why yes, not? Yes, if it's if it's what equals your fancy, yes, fancy. why not? Um, but it is not in all of those things. The the reason why we live purposeful lives is because God doesn't work anymore, and that's why you can't be sending calling what God put you on earth to do a hustle. God doesn't work anymore. He works through us. So when you show up and you do what God has called you to do and you do it properly, then what would have happened is that you have established the kingdom in the earth. And to establish the kingdom in the earth, it's not by praying in church. It's by getting on the streets and doing the work that we are called to do. Okay, sis, we have a question here from Smith. Mokotra. How do we discover our purpose in life? That is 10 weeks of my time that I can't give to you in one hour. But maybe if you prayed, maybe if you paid attention to, again, those three things, your first dominion, your experiences, and your environment, it will be, give you an indicator to what you should be doing, your assignment. Remember we said that Purpose is the same. Everyone that God has called us, every one of us is called to bring glory to God. And when it comes to the question of about ethics, I think that there's nothing like business ethics or Christian ethics or Muslim ethics. Ethics is ethics. ethics if yeah. you have ethics as an individual, you would express it everywhere. You would express that level of living or standard of living everywhere you go. So there are no Christian ethics beyond be a good human being. If you are a good human being as a believer, when you get to a business place, you will not cheat someone. That's what ethics is about, isn't it? You will be disciplined. Is that not what yes. ethics is about? So yes. you find that in the core of us, what God wants us to be are good human beings. And as long as we get that, the ethics question will be answered. So um, I can't marry purposeful living with as Christian ethics, because there are no Christian ethics. But if you're a good human being and you are on earth and you know that you are here to glorify God, then everything you do, you will take it through the filter of, does this glorify God? Will this hurt someone else? Does this satisfy me? And does this flow naturally out of me? If you can answer those four questions I've given you four out of my five way tests, I think I've tried. Um, you ought to be able to say where it is that you fall or what side of the divide God is configured you to express your, 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 your superpower in. Okay, guys, thank you for the questions. 
and we are rounding up. But before we round up, I just want to show you two books again. I'm trying to get the best angle. Okay, this is The Theology of Work. It's an excellent book for all those who want to know why they should work. Theology of Work. And then this is the one that we are giving away today, two copies to two lucky people, Building Blocks. These are two of the 18 books. I don't own all of Sister B's books, but I think I own quite a few, you know. I, I think I own at least 10 of her books, you know. Since I think I own 11 of your books. Yes. So you, you, you need to get the remaining seven. I, I need to get the remaining seven. Since it don't reach time for you to give me discount. <laughs> so We've been please, doing a promo since now. I know for me, I, I'm taking I'm, that's why I wanted to give people this. That's why I, I took advantage of that. I took advantage of that, you know. So um ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who want to order a copy of Pastor Bidemi's book, please take down this number. 0809-056-3555. You can also check on Amazon so you can see which of the books you want. Once you type in her name, you'll see all the books. They just they'll just show. So you can be if you um if you reach out to that number, they would deliver the books to you. Um, most of my books are not carried by the bookstores. We do direct um, sales and um, and then deliveries. So if you'd like to order, and you reach out to that number. Um, they would respond to you within the hour. I'm sure they will. Thank you. So I'm monitoring okay. on Facebook. That's why. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we have um, four minutes left. Um, guys, before I ask my last question, do you have any question? Okay. I, I have a question, this is very quickly. I, I, I don't know how you can do this very quickly because you, okay. you, you spend time teaching me. You talked about the, with our giftings or our talents that we can have at least four ways of um, four streams four expressions four streams of yes income. four streams could, could, four expressions. could you please please explain yes, that and, and that comes out of genesis chapter two really because I'm, I'm i have to be fast every one gift i say to people that one gift is enough for a lifetime so for instance let me give the example of my life my gifts predominant gifts my dominant gifts are words by words i've written books that's a stream of expression by words, I train corporates. I train in corporates. That's a stream of expression. By words, I lead a, 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 a faith expression. That's a stream of expression. By words, I'm doing this. Um, as I, I coach, I teach, I mentor. That's another stream of expression. When you distill the first thing that God gives you, which is your leverage gift when I talk about it, you ought to be, as you grow and you mature in understanding what God put you on earth to do and you begin to do it, what you will find is that you are able to use your one gift in four different ways. Every gift, you can use it in four different ways. So, um, Julia, um, uh, JJC started with Unplugged. Out of Unplugged, we've now seen very well made in Nigeria. And I'm sure there are other things in the pipeline and the, um, there's the a life spa that I saw you do. Yes, it's still the yes. same. It's the same knowledge that you are using to distill these different expressions. And the idea is, if you don't buy a book, you listen to an audio book. If you don't listen to an audio book, you listen to a message. If you don't listen to the virtual one, you will show up in person. And so, if you have one gift, you ought not to struggle because that one gift can give you four different ways of for impact and four different ways of earning. That's really it, it in a nutshell. Well, guys, we are open to, for business in January. I, I couldn't think of a better gift to give you than the gift of my, my friend and my coach, Lady Miba Modi, you know. She, um, she's a joy, she's a gift, and I, I really treasure her. 
you know i really do thank, thank you. you so much sis thank you thank you thank you um, guys we're about to do that raffle draw if you picked um a, a number please write it down if you didn't pick a number write it down you see how many uh, you see how many numbers do we have okay we only have eight numbers but two of these books are going now and they're going to be picked at random by sister b so if you did not write down a number but you want a copy of this book which i can assure you i've been i don't know how to show you i've been writing this is why i don't give people my books i've been writing all over my book you know so please if you do want i'll just give you 30 seconds if you do want um to 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 win a chance to win it just put down a number if you have not put down a number before we are at the top of the arm we have to to shut down we have to be disciplined that way okay since no numbers coming in so please could you pick any number um i'll pick number i'll pick number 18 and number seven do we have a number seven? Yes. Okay. Do you have a number 18? Yes. Okay. So who are the winners? Okay. So we have two winners. Imabasi is number seven. And uh, Nahoro. Sorry. No, scratch okay. that. Enahoro can't win. Enahoro is in, in, in at the well. He can't win that. So I'll okay, pick sorry. another number. Okay. I'll pick another number. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 I think da, somebody da, da, da. has just... Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. I'll pick yes, number nobody. 11 next. Okay, Mavis Marshall Idio. Yes, we have two winners. Ima Basi and Mavis Marshall. So, congratulations. These books are going to come to you very soon. Very soon. Yeah. Ima is in Lagos and Mavis is in Port Harcourt. So we'll get those to you very, very soon. Congratulations. Sis, thank you. And please, what, what, what last words would you give us to give um, us a boost? Um, first, I want, I want to say thank you for having me. And then, um, Julia, keep doing what you're doing um, in another two, three short years, we would see this and we'll marvel at how far this can grow and how far it can go. Um, so well done and keep doing what you're doing. I want to thank you, see your able assistant for the work that she does behind the scene. You see, thank you so much. For everybody else who showed up at Unplugged this afternoon, thank you, God bless you. I pray that God will be kinder to you in 2022 than he was kind to you in 2021. And um, when it comes to um, your business and your work, keep at it one day at a time. Surely there's gold inside what you're mining. And when the time comes, it will break open for you. Thank you for having me and God bless you. Thank you very much, sis. God bless you. You're and welcome. thank you, everybody. See you. Bye, Bye sis. Bye, Bye, everybody. See you next week. Next week, we are here with another show. Um, the Roadmap to Better Business by Ekaita Umo. It's another one you'd like to, to watch. So see you next week. Bye-bye.